Now we return to the front line of this crisis, to the hospitals and medical health providers. How is the pandemic changing the way that healthcare is delivered to patients? And are the changes introduced as emergency measures in the last six months likely to change methods of treatment in the future? We go now to one of the world's leading medical practitioners, Dr. Paul Rothman, Dean of the Medical Faculty at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine in Baltimore and CEO of Johns Hopkins Medicine, the global provider for data about the pandemic. Dr. Rothman, thank you for joining us. Johns Hopkins and almost every other healthcare provider moved rapidly to virtual care. Do you see that change continuing beyond the pandemic? And in what other ways will the pandemic change the healthcare system and medical training? Well, Matthew, thanks for having me today. I think that's a really great question. Uh, you know, we went from uh, providing a couple dozen telehealth visits a day uh, before the pandemic to uh, 5,500 uh, every day in about uh, less than two weeks. That was quite an undertaking for us. Um, it's been very successful in terms of our ability to deliver care during the pandemic. If you ask me uh, long term, I think we, our providers have found a lot of upside on telehealth. I think, first of all, patients find it very convenient. Obviously, they don't have to leave their home. Often the patient is more relaxed, and so the visit in some way uh, doesn't have the anxiety of a patient visiting an office, um, and that's been very helpful. Uh, finally, um, you sometimes can see how a patient lives in the environments, which uh, many practitioners have also found very helpful. On the downside, um, certainly there are visits that have to occur in person because you need to do a physical exam. I think uh, that will still occur in the future. And in addition, I think, uh, especially for new patients, um, there's a bonding that goes on between a physician and a patient that it, you cannot recapitulate during a televisit. So I think there'll be telehealth. If you ask me how much, I would say about 30% of the visits we used to have um, in person will probably be via tele in the future. It also gives us the ability to reach out way beyond uh, where we did, and we are an international healthcare provider, but uh, still patients who didn't want to travel for one reason or another, we can provide care via tele. I think the, uh, uh, the longevity and permanency will depend on the payers. So right now in the United States, uh, the payers are paying for telehealth at a level uh, commensurate to where an in-person visit was. If uh, that payment gets ratcheted down, at least in the US, I think you're gonna not see uh, the uptake of tele long term that you otherwise would. You asked me other ways that would uh, pandemic would change the way we deliver care. I think there are several. I think first of all, you know, when we began this, the reason we moved to tele was the safety of both our patients and our healthcare providers, given uh, the pandemic and the easy uh, spread of uh, the virus. I think moving forward, some of those changes will be permanent. I think the size of our waiting rooms will go down. I think our asking patients to wait in a common space will go away. I think you'll find a lot of just uh, uh, changes in to ensure patient safety that will be long-term. I think another, and that has implications for the size of our space, for the number of employees we have and their skill set. I think that all will change uh, at some level after. And finally, um, I also think that, you know, the pandemic uh, demonstrated uh, susceptibilities of our supply chain in many ways. Uh, we and others have overcome that by multiple mechanisms because we did need to ensure that we had the medications and also the personal protective equipment for our um, providers. Um, I think long term, we will change uh, how we uh, ensure that we have the equipment and supplies we need. And I think we will redistribute and we look at the vulnerabilities in our supply chain for everything from disposables to the pharmaceuticals and ensure that um, that we don't have any vulnerabilities moving forward. You've said that a key focus area for the future will be precision digital medicine. How is that going to change medical practice in future? And how does precision medicine allow us to better understand COVID-19? So just quickly define what I mean by precision medicine. Uh, we, we're in the midst of three revolutions, the revolution of big data, a revolution of connectivity 
and a revolution of measurement. So we are connected via our devices and other equipment to uh, our medical record at all time. We have data scientists that can absorb and look through a, a great deal of data and come out with solutions to that data. And we now have measurements of individual patients from genomics and proteomics to uh, advanced imaging. What we do is use in our precision medicine is that we use all of those uh, um, different array of solutions to look at the individual, individual patient and be able to bring all the measurements to bear on that patient and understand how that patient is different from other patients. When I mean, you think about that for COVID, you add in that we clearly now we know that a person's genetics have the role there. Their so, uh, sociodemographics have a role in their response. I mean, uh, there is some hint that the viral genome that changes may have an interplay with the human genome of the infected patient. And we now have a lot of measurements from um, oxygen levels to different uh, measurements of the immune system. And we think uh, using our precision medicine platform that will bring all those measurements to bear on that individual patient that might have COVID to help us better treat them. Now, there's been a lot of commentary about how this crisis has underscored the differences in quality and access to healthcare in different countries and even different areas within the same country. What has the pandemic taught you about the fault lines in the varying provisions of national and global public health? I think we can see that um, either um, areas that could be countries or states or cities that have a robust uh, public health infrastructure have been able to deal with the pandemic much more effectively. Um, I think we also have to realize that we are, that the world is flat. We are one world and what could affect uh, patients on one side of the globe will eventually come and affect us all. So I think our investment and increased investment in public health is going to be key for us, not only for this pandemic, but other emerging infectious diseases. Dr. Paul Rothman, Dean of the Medical Faculty at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine and CEO of Johns Hopkins Medicine, thank you for being with us. Thank you, Matthew.